Good morning, everybody. Hope everything's going well and welcome uh, to uh, the latest Facebook Live. Um, looking forward to uh, sharing uh, some of my thoughts about um, facial uh, nerve issues. And we have had many, many, many uh, questions that have been sent in in anticipation of our Facebook Live. And uh, today I'll try to um, focus a little bit more on uh, discussing um, details of what we're, you know, how I'm thinking about someone who has a uh, facial nerve issue. And um, hopefully you guys can get um, some insight on my approach, on the way I look at things and so forth. So um, looking forward to, uh, uh, to sharing some of my thoughts over the next few minutes. So I'm going to start with um, our first question uh, is, I have uh, pain in, uh, in an infected eye for some time. It's unbearable. I don't know what I should do. So this is a very, very, very important question because obviously our focus always is how do we you know, make you smile better, blink better, look better. That's what, you know, function better. But uh, the facial nerve has many, many things that it helps us do. And to start with, the way that you got to think about our facial movement is we have many muscles that perform different functions on our face. We have muscles around the eye that help us close our eyes and protect the cornea and help blink and continue um, lubricating our eyes. These are very, very important functions. We have muscles that help us smile. We have muscles that frown, muscles that help us pucker um, and articulate. These are all independent, but the facial nerve, if you think about the facial nerve, it's a wiring system that connects the brain to these muscles. The brain sends and generates the signals and the face acts upon it. And these, this bundle of nerves travels behind the ear all together. And as it exits the ear, just under where your earlobe is, it starts dividing into multiple different branches. Now, when we smile, when we blink, when we you know, do a lot of facial movement, the majority of those movements are spontaneous, natural, emotional. We're not thinking about it. You're not thinking about blinking. It's just happening. A lot of times if you're watching a funny movie or you're talking at a dinner table, you're not thinking about smiling. Yes, you may like be, do a polite smile if you're faking it, but for the most part, if someone's laughing out loud, they're just smiling, they're not controlling it. So that's a key aspect of facial function and facial movement is that spontaneity that's really, really important. Now, getting back to the eye, when the facial nerve is injured or damaged, or even if someone is born without activity of the facial nerve, what happens to the muscles, the muscles stop working. So when the eye muscle st stops working, the blinking muscle, the cornea and the top layer of the eye, eyeball, get, starts getting dry because the lubrication of the cornea, the top layer of the eye is very, very important in its health, okay? So when that happens, the cornea, again, that top layer, the top part, the front part of the eye gets dry, it can ulcerate, it can scab, kind of like if you have a scab, and that can lead to potentially blindness, damage, infection, so many different things. So the most critical aspect, if someone you know or you have facial paralysis and your eyes are itching, irritated, you feel like there's sand in the eye, your cornea may be at risk. If you see redness, these are all signs that your cornea may be at risk. So the first thing I would say is go see an ophthalmologist because they need to evaluate your eye and determine what is going on with it. Because we can recuperate your facial smile, but if you get permanently blind, it's really hard to reverse that. So that is the most important thing. And what are some of the
common things that we do. Obviously, if your eye is very, very dry, we want you to lubricate it with artificial tears. We want you to, at night, put gel ointment, specialized gel ointment. We want you to even sometimes, if your eyes don't close, tape your eyes shut at night. Sometimes we have to put a, something that permanently lubricates the eye with, um, it's called a pros lens. That's a very specialized lens. And if your eye is permanently damaged or we anticipate that you have significant issues, we have to perform surgeries that help your eye closure and tighten the lower eyelid. And those procedures vary depending on what your issue is and circumstances, but it could be utilizing gold or platinum weights. These are actually gold and platinum little bars, thin, thin bars that go up underneath the skin to help the eye close. We also have specialized techniques that tighten the lower eyelid. And this can all be done very aesthetically if it's necessary. And that's the key thing. It depends on your situation. So for a situation that someone has pain, infected eye, you need to be seen by your ophthalmologist. And if this issue has not resolved, you need to eventually or permanently have some surgical procedures that help the eye closure. So this is very, very important. And probably the most important thing when someone acutely, immediately gets facial paralysis from you know, Bell's palsy or an acoustic neuroma or Ramsey Hunt syndrome or trauma, and we are not anticipating great reversal, so this needs to be taken care of. The other thing is the age of the individual. Younger patients tend to be able to tolerate having dryness to their eye better than someone who is over the age of 45. Also, there is a protective mechanism called Bell's phenomenon. This is different than Bell's palsy. Bell's phenomenon is when we try to close our eyes, the eyeball rolls up. So the front part of our eye where we see through rolls out of the way. People who have that, what we call Bell's phenomenon, tend to have a better chance of not getting permanent damage. So these are, again, your doctor or official nerve expert should be able to help out with that. So I hope that um, answered uh, your question with uh with this particular uh issue um the next question is um i've had bell's palsy two years ago and after three months my face kind of went back to normal but i still notice it when i smile and my eye twitches a lot like the bottom part of my eye following with a vein that i think looks swollen after a while the twitching stops and a month ago it came right back. My question is, will it ever stop? Do I need to go to therapy to the point that I get my nerves um, uh, triggered? And uh, I can't talk to anyone because I just feel like they stare at my eyes. So this is, um, this is a very interesting question because what the, so let's talk about Bell's palsy. What it, not all paralysis is Bell's palsy. And for a lot of people, they think, oh, if they have paralysis, it's Bell's palsy. And so there are many different causes of facial paralysis. The most common cause is Bell's palsy. And we decide that someone has Bell's palsy when all other causes of facial paralysis are ruled out. So what does that mean? It means that we don't have a tumor, we don't have Ramsey Hunt syndrome, we don't have Lyme disease, we don't have uh, other trauma. If everything else is ruled out, then by deduction, we're gonna say that person has Bell's palsy. And the most common cause of Bell's palsy is a virus that inflames the nerve. You remember we talked about the nerve being running all together behind the ear and the bone in that area, there is a part that the nerve turns and it's a very narrow turn. And if there's inflammation in the nerve, the nerve stops working, but it stops working 
temporarily. If you have Bell's palsy within three months, just like in this case, this patient within three months, the face kind of went back to normal. So if you have Bell's palsy within two to three months, you should start seeing your laugh line come back. You should start seeing your cheeks elevate. Even if your smile isn't perfect, you should start seeing some tone. Your eye closure should start getting better. If that is not the case, then you need to see a facial nerve expert because it could be that you don't have Bell's palsy and you have some other issue. Just a few weeks ago, I saw a, a gentleman in his 60s who was scheduled to have actually eyelid reconstruction because he had been diagnosed with Bell's palsy about a year earlier. And his eye closure was not complete and he was scheduled to have surgery the following week. And he had come to see me to see what I could do with his facial smile issues. And he had no movement, was completely flat. And unfortunately I had to sit down and say, and it, he was such a nice gentleman. I'm like, I had to sit down and tell him, I think you have something more serious. and. It ended up after our workup that he had a malignancy that had involved his facial nerve. He had a cancer. And these things are much better if we can treat it nine months earlier. And that's what would have happened. Unfortunately, this gentleman got delayed in his treatment because you know, he was diagnosed with Bell's palsy and he never followed and doctors didn't pick up what was going on. So it is imperative, you guys who are on this Facebook Live, you guys are essentially no more than many doctors that tr that are you know in, in our profession. So please make sure you become champions of patients who have facial paralysis, help them with their issues and to get to the right person. So in this individual, this question, three months, the face went back to normal, and now this patient has twitching and irritation. So what do we assume from that? Anytime at three months or after, there's anything that's not beyond normalcy, I always recommend go see a facial nerve expert. Let them analyze you, examine you. Maybe you need MRIs, x-rays, and so forth. This sounds like, and this is what I would recommend for this person. It sounds like the person had Bell's palsy. There's some twitching, and that twitching sounds like a lot like what we call synkinesis. Now, what is synkinesis? So when the nerve is injured, like Bell's palsy, as it regrows facial nerve, nerves are like weed. Sometimes they just grow, actually, out of control and that's what sometimes happens for uh, about probably 10 to 20 percent of patients who have bell's palsy or ramsey hunt syndrome and the nerves just kind of grow out of control and cause overactivity of muscles rather than underactivity so initially when someone gets bell's palsy or ramsey hunt syndrome which is similar to bell's palsy except it's caused by a chicken pox virus rather than a herpes virus uh, and people get rashes in the inner ear and really bad hearing loss. As the nerve regrows, the, sometimes it regrows the wrong way. Different muscles get activated instead of not getting activated and overactivated. So you go from a problem of underactivity to a problem of overactivity. And that overactivity has to be controlled with a variety of different things. And the three key treatments that we have and it depends on what your condition is botox botox is a injection into the muscles that relaxes muscles physiotherapy and neuromuscular retraining that helps you retrain and also understand the movements and coordinating the movements and sometimes improve the cramping of the muscles and the third thing is surgical procedures that can help rewire the mechanisms that are overactive. And those are procedures that, one of the procedures that I pioneered called the selective neurolysis. That's a very, very straightforward procedure that we utilize incisions around the ear and go identify these various nerves 
And if they're overactive, we reduce the activity. And we've published on this and it's been really great. So a combination for synkinesis, a combination of surgery, Botox, neuromuscular retraining. But for, for um, this question, I would say you need to see a facial nerve expert and an ophthalmologist or oculoplastic surgeon to get evaluated. Next question um, is actually, you know what, we're gonna go to um, one of the comments that someone put, I've had synkinesis since 1999, is there any hope for me? Absolutely, it doesn't matter how long you've had synkinesis or facial paralysis. Today, in this era, the way I look at my patients, we see what the issue is. Is the nerve present or not? Is it active or not? Are the muscles present or not? Active or not? Is there synkinesis or complete paralysis? We have so many different options. The key thing is we want to get spontaneity, natural movement. So we are always thinking about rewiring, utilizing whatever activity that you have to the best of our ability to get you the best smile. So someone who has synkinesis, doesn't matter if it's from 38 years ago, 20 years ago, or today, we have an opportunity as long as your muscles are present to rewire that activity, use neuromuscular retraining, Botox, and the selective neurolysis that I've just discussed to get really, really great uh, uh, outcomes. We also have to, at rest, get your face to be more symmetrical. So the procedure that I like to utilize called the symmetrical facial repositioning, that we will improve the position of the fat compartments and the tissues to even out the appearance. So absolutely, there are so many opportunities. And last uh, uh, last week, I performed a surgery on someone who had had Bell's palsy 38 years ago. And you know, finally, she was like, "Okay, I want to get it improved." And we performed a selective neurolysis with symmetrical facial repositioning. So this is really, really. It, uh, takeaway, I would say, right now, there are two major takeaways and these couple of questions. One is, if you're diagnosed with Bell's palsy, and if in three months you have no activity, you need to see a facial nerve expert immediately. If there is no one right there and then, see an ENT, okay, or a head and neck cancer expert immediately. That is very, very important. The second takeaway so far is that regardless of how long you've had facial paralysis, or synkinesis, or Bell's palsy, whatever it is, there is hope for improving your condition. There's no guarantee, and there's always some variability in outcome, and you know, surgeries, no matter how wonderful they are, how amazing your surgeon is, can always result in outcomes that are less than ideal, but if, your surgeon and your surgeon and your the way that they look at it is you know they analyze you they customize the procedures and they know how to perform these procedures that are very very detail oriented and take years and years and years to get better and they have an artistic viewpoint to your issue then i think you're able to get a great result and a lot of times i tell I tell you know patients that you know we're kind of like electrical engineers because we're rewiring things, structural engineers because we're repositioning tissue, and artists because we have to look at the face and see what's going to look amazing. So this is kind of how I look at it. And that's why outcomes are different amongst different surgeons, amongst different doctors, and just you need to look at before and afters and see what doctor kind of fits what your goals are, okay? Because most doctors, most surgeons are putting out their good work. You also need to look at what the starting point of that before and after is, because sometimes when the starting point is really, really, really major, major deformity, then outcomes, 
you know, are going to be a little bit harder. And sometimes there's some subtle issues that the doctors are dealing with. So, um, so let's see if, um, thank you. There's so many nice comments. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Oh, that's so sweet, Colleen. Uh, are you for real? I like. I feel like crying. Thank you. Um, so, Jason actually puts in a great question. I've had Bell's palsy three times in the same area. That is a great question because people often ask if I've had Bell's palsy, can I get it again? And the 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 answer there's uh, two aspects to the answer. The the kind of the sad news is yes you can get it again and someone who's had bell's palsy has a higher likelihood of getting bell's palsy again however the chances are still pretty low compared to the overall health issues that can be there so um so i would just be very uh, vigilant make sure you know you have um you know, uh, you, you know the symptoms when they happen because you want to get treated right away. So that's a that's a, a comment I wanted to make with with that. This one, we had a couple of questions that are all in the similar um, frame as this. I've had pain associated with paralysis on my face ever since the onset. What is causing this? How can I get it get rid of the constant tightness in my cheeks? Physical therapy has only made the pain worse, and this is six. This is year six for me. So, pain is one of the hardest things for any doctor to treat or alleviate because there's some subjectivity to it, and there's some objectivity to it. But for the most part, I'm going to kind of divide this up into two different factors. One is the immediate facial paralysis. If someone either you or someone you know develops facial paralysis and has severe pain in the ear and irritation and little vesicles, that's giving us a signal that this is the most likely a result of Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. And Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is very, very similar to Bell's palsy, except it's caused by the chickenpox virus. And oftentimes patients present with pain hearing loss, sometimes dizziness, and a rash inside the ear. Now, it could be variable. Some people have a lot of rash. Some people have a little bit. Some people have very little. But that's the initial presentation. So those individuals, obviously, anytime Bell's palsy or Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, we need to treat that individual as soon as we can with steroids. Studies have shown that steroids really help improve outcomes. Antiviral medicines have some studies have shown improvement in outcomes some studies have not but definitely steroids and you know most often i do like to treat with antivirals as soon as possible and make sure the steroids are high dose again under a doctor's direction and this is everything that i'm saying you need to be under a doctor's direction so now you remember we talked about synkinesis that there is overactivity of nerve and abnormal nerve regeneration, different muscles. Like when you're trying to smile, your frowning muscles get activated. The platysma gets activated. So you get, un, you know, a miscoordinated movement. Now what happens is overactivity can cramp up muscles. So if anyone out there is a runner, they know sometimes when you're running, you get a cramp in your calf muscle. That calf muscle is not paralyzed. It's just super, super tight. And your, your treatment of it is not to go and run more. It's to stretch it out. And cramping can cause pain. So in this situation, it sounds like there is a lot of cramping in the cheek area, which is common. Many patients present with cramping in the neck area, and that's common. And the treatment for that is exactly what we had just talked about, a combination depending on the situation of physiotherapy, neuromuscular retraining, Botox, and surgery. 
again, depending on your situation. It doesn't guarantee that pain goes away. I always, this is one of my mentors always taught me, you can't promise pain goes away with surgery. And so we don't know what the underlying issue is. But what I would say for this individual, see a facial nerve expert, make sure there's no other cause for your facial nerve issue. And it may require imaging or evaluation assessment. And then if everything else is, uh, is improved or ruled out, then I think the opportunities for improvement is very, very, very good. Um, so let me see. Okay, this is a good question. If the seventh qu cranial nerve, and that's the facial nerve, is firing to 80%, for example, what options are there? Is there only an option of cross-face nerve graft? Is there anything less invasive? So let's talk about this. So there are a select group of individuals that, especially individuals who develop facial paralysis at a very young age, three, four, five, that we don't know why, but as they regenerate, they don't get synkinesis. Some do, but they get 70, 80% of the function back. So they have some movement, but not as good of a movement as the unaffected side. So for this question, what do we do? So again, my algorithm, the way I look at it is I want to make sure the neuromuscular pathway of a natural smile is always there, which what does that mean? Your brain is connected to your muscles through your own facial nerve. So if muscles are atrophied or not present, we need to reintroduce muscle. If the nerves are not generating enough activity, but the muscles are there, we need to increase the activity of the nerve. So we need to increase the wattage. We need to increase the energy. If the brain cannot be connected to the muscles because let's say there was a tumor in the brain, like an acoustic neuroma, or there was a temporal bone fracture or fracture or trauma back here that we can't connect, then we wanna connect another nerve or a nerve from the opposite side. So there are all these technical ways, and you know I won't go through the details of a cross-face nerve graft right now, but there are so many different nerves, muscles, and activity. But for me, and that's why this is not cookie cutter. This, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I'm going to, uh, I want a cross-face nerve graft. And they call me up and say, do you do a cross-face nerve graft? Well, there's 5 million ways of doing a cross-face nerve graft. There are so many different ways of doing selective neurolysis. There are so many different ways of doing a gracilis muscle. The outcome of these operation rely on what the initial issue is with you, how it's customized, and how it's executed. So it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, if you get an iPhone from, you know, Amazon or go to Apple computer, Apple store, you're gonna get the same iPhone, right? But it's not like that. So we have to, for, for this individual, I have to analyze your face, see what you need. If we need to do a nerve graft, where that nerve is going to go into, what we are going to do after, how we're gonna reposition your tissue. So it is a very, very complicated algorithm of techniques. And as I uh, discussed earlier, we have to put on our engineering hat, uh, electrical engineering hat, structural engineering hat, architectural hat, and our artistic hat, bring that all together to get the best possible outcome. So let's do one last question. Um, okay, this question is interesting. So this individual's concern is uh, 32 years old, who suffered deformity and facial paralysis by cutting the facial nerve during a surgery in 2001, 
So that's about 18 years ago by accident in a clinic in Algeria. Since that time, I was looking for a way to solve this problem that bothers me a lot. For that, I would like to benefit from your experience by reconstructive surgery or offer me a favorable solution. Thank you so much for um, that question. So to be able to answer, obviously I have to do a physical examination and see what the smile deformity is. But what we want to do, as we talked about, is enhance, preserve, or augment the neural pathway between the brain, facial nerve, and the muscles. So if someone has had complete paralysis for more than a year or a year and a half, where the nerve is not giving nerve input into the muscles, the muscles on that side will permanently atrophy where we cannot revive it. Under a year, we can revive that mus those muscles by giving some nerve input from other nerve sources. After a year or two, it's very hard to revive it. If we cannot revive it, we gotta bring in new muscle. And we can bring in little teeny muscles from the inner thigh called the gracilis muscle. We can use the pectoralis minor muscle. There's a lot of different muscles we can use. The nerve connections to that have to, again, you could bring in muscle, but it's gotta be connected to something that's giving a signal from the brain. And those nerves can be connected to a nerve graft from the opposite side, like a cross facial nerve graft, can be connected to a nerve that goes to your chewing muscle, the masseteric nerve, or a combination of the two, or sometimes there's some activity that we can utilize. So if in this case there's no facial activity, we have to introduce new muscle. If there is some activity and the individual has synkinesis, that means the nerve was cut but not completely cut or the nerve regenerated, then we can look at what we talked about earlier, the selective neurolysis. Sometimes I'll do a combination of both, a cross-face nerve graft, selective neurolysis, and sometimes we'll do also a gracilis with all of that. So it really depends on what's going on. I would recommend that you, um, you know, see a facial nerve expert uh, or reach out to us for a formal evaluation, which we would love to do. So our time is up. I hope today has been uh, good. Uh, I, I feel like there were some really, really great questions. Um, uh, we are uh, going to be doing some really, really exciting um, uh, new, uh, uh, new ventures. Uh, so please look uh, and we'll be uh, posting about our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe to it. Um, also, uh, our Instagram, we have a Facial Paralysis Institute Instagram uh, 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 account that uh, we post and discuss different um, topics. So please look at that. We do also, there's something called Instagram TV, IGTV that we put some videos, surgical videos. Some of you may not wanna be seeing it, but some people are interested in it. Um, and also I'm starting a podcast called Smile. So it's really, really exciting about um, health and wellness and beauty and uh, we have some really exciting uh, stories and guests and um, I think it'll be a fantastic outlet, which I hope you guys will subscribe and we'll be posting about those soon. Uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Thank you for tuning in. And I know we have people from all the continents around the world tuning in. So that's really exciting. And uh, I look forward to uh, being with you soon.